All right, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome everybody in the room, and uh, welcome to our online audience. Uh, for this, our uh, last C-Star lecture of the season. This is our second season. Um, before I introduce uh, my esteemed colleague and the speaker for today, Julius Fredrickson, I quickly want to say something about those of you uh, who like to binge watch our YouTube channel. <laughs> we are, um, uh, I am, catching up with uh, editing uh, the uh, videos. Uh, we had a, a little bit of a backlog. Uh, Susan Duncan's uh, talk is now online, as well as Fatih Kiran's talk uh, two, years, uh, two weeks ago. And um, uh, Audrey Holland's talk is uh, almost online. So uh, tomorrow, I expect that talk to be online as well. And then uh, the only thing we have left to present to you is uh, the workshop videos uh, for the workshop that we had in January. So that is coming up. Um, my apologies for the delay, that's all coming up. Today, we'll be uh, listening to uh, Dr. Julius Fredrickson, uh, who is the PI of our C-STAR project, the Center for the Study of Aphasia Recovery. Um, he is uh, going to be talking about a clinical trial that his group has done uh, to look at the effects of transcranial direct current stimulation. So that's very exciting work. I know that most of you will know Julius already, so I don't need to talk long about all the other um, uh, magnificent work that he's doing. So I'm going to quickly give the floor to my friend Julius. Um, and not before I tell you that we'll be back after the summer, uh, likely at the end of August, with our first uh, Sea Star lecture of the season. And that schedule will be uh, coming up on the website, or will start to fill up on the website uh, pretty soon. So for now, uh, Julius. All right, thank you very much, Dirk. Um, so, I have a lot of data to present, so I think I'm just gonna get right into it. As Dirk said, um, I'm gonna be talking about the results of a recent clinical trial that we completed in my lab. Um, the title of it was The Effects of uh, TDCS on Aphasia Treatment Outcomes. Um, the outline is gonna be a so, I'm gonna start by talking about previous studies, and when I say previous studies, I'm talking about specifically studies that we have done in my lab on TDCS and aphasia treatment. There's a lot of other research that has been done in, uh, in this area, and I'll get this a little bit later, but plenty of other folks that have looked at TDCS to enhance aphasia treatment outcome, and those studies certainly should not be ignored. But I'm gonna talk about our studies because those are this, the pilot studies that led into our clinical trial. Then I'm going to talk specifically about the trial, the overall outcome, and the BDNF uh, genotype results, and I will uh, mention later what all that means. I'm not going to give a, an extensive primer on what uh, TDCS is and how it works. For those of you who are not familiar with this technique, I would suggest that uh, you look up some very excellent review papers on TDCS that have been published uh, in the literature, also nice uh, book chapters that, that describe TDCS in, in much greater detail than what I'm going to get into here. For the sake of time, I'm just going to say that uh, TDCS essentially, the way that it's applied in most cases, uh, it relies on inducing a current between two pad electrodes that are placed on the scalp. Uh, in this case, an anode electrode on the left scalp here, uh, which is indicated by this red right here, and a cathode electrode on the right scalp. Uh, what that does is that um, it induces that current, so under, uh, this is the anode electrode, and this is the cathode electrode, and what you do is that you induce a current between those two electrodes. Uh, the current flows inward under the anode electrode, and it uh, flows outwards under the cathode electrode. In short, anode stimulation is thought to have excitatory effects on the cortex, and the cathode stimulation is thought to have inhibitory effects on the, the cortex. There's a lot of TDCS work that has been done out there so far. Most of it has been done in normal subjects. And TDCS, uh, in this case, anode TDCS has been suggested in several different studies. It has been suggested to boost long-term memory, improve attention, improve working memory, enhance learning of different kinds like motor processing, vocabulary, and arithmetic. But I think that most of these studies, I think that we probably feel a lot more comfortable 
if we would see much more extensive replication because most of these studies include fairly small, small sample sizes. The same thing applies to TVCS in clinical populations. Uh, TVCS has been suggested to be effective or at least helpful in treating things like depression, MS, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, migraine headache, drug abuse, tinnitus, and a very severe condition, clinical condition of liking the song Despacito, <laughs> which is one, one of the great ailments that plagues our population today. It also has been suggested to um, have positive effects for motor recovery and stroke, and language and communication recovery in uh, people with aphasia. The problem with most of this research is that it's based on single case studies, or very small group studies. So therefore, as a result, um, the evidence that has been accumulated is not particularly strong because of these sample sizes being so small. Now, so why would you want to use TDCS to treat aphasia? Well, there are several neuroimaging studies that suggest that changes in functional activation in the brain support improved language processing. So, if TDCS can be used to modulate or either excite or inhibit brain activation, then perhaps it can be used to enhance, encourage, boost, change, whatever you call it, brain activation, and then improve language processing, either during aphasia therapy or in the absence of aphasia therapy. So far, most of the research of this kind has focused on coupling TDCS with the aphasia therapy, and that's where we've seen the most promising effects. That's going to lead me into our first pilot study, and that's how it all started with this first pilot study. Um, our initial question was simply, does brain stimulation improve aphasia treatment outcomes, specifically transcranial director and stimulation or TBCS, or is there a reasonable effect to motivate further study? I will admit that the, the way that we came up with this in the first place was because of a conversation that I had with a colleague, uh, Mark George, uh, who is at the Medical University of South Carolina. He's really a guru in electrical brain stimulation, and he sort of turned me on to TDCS. We talked about this uh, um, as a potential uh, method that could improve aphasia treatment outcome. That's really how it started, about 10 years ago. And one of my students, Julie Baker, took this on as a uh, dissertation topic, and that's how we started this first study. I have to say that both myself and my, my collaborator, Chris Rorden, we were pretty skeptical, skeptical, I would have to say, when we started out with this. But we thought, if, uh, if Julie wanted to take this on, fine, let's see what happens. So anyway, in this first study, uh, there were 10 participants with chronic aphasia with various different aphasia types and severities. Um, they all underwent two weeks of treatment. There were only five uh, sessions per week, and the session length was, was 20 minutes. The reason why we only did 20 minutes was because at that time, TDCS had not been proven to be safe beyond 20 minutes, and that's why we selected a uh, very short treatment session. That is not a reflection of what we would think most people in, in clinical care would, re would receive today. All of the participants uh, during all of their treatment sessions received uh, aphasia therapy that relied on this visual speech perception to treat a pneumonia task. The paper that describes this aphasia therapy was published in the journal Stroke back in 2009. Essentially what this is, is that it's a computer computerized treatment uh, based on speech perception. So it does rely on picture, word matching, and here how, here's how it goes. The treatment task itself is an audiovisual speech uh, relies on audiovisual speech stimulation with phonological, semantic, and unrelated distractors. The person sits in front of a computer screen. They have these uh, response buttons that you see right here, and they have headphones where they can hear the speech. What they will see on the computer screen is a picture, like in this case a dog. Then they will hear a word and see the speaker say that word here in the same car. And then they have to press either the green or the red button, depending on whether they thought what they, they saw in the picture and what they heard and saw the speaker say, whether that matches. And then they get immediate feedback. We had the quarter of the stimuli included correct matches. 
a quarter had phonological distractors, a quarter semantic distractors, and then the final quarter, quarter included unrelated words. And they simply had to, to decide match or no match, and then they would get direct feedback. Um, here's the TDCS part. The, the design was a double-blinded crossover study, so everybody got both anoral and sham TDCS. Um, so somebody might have started with a week of anoral stimulation while they were doing the aphasia therapy, then they would get a week off, and then they would do the uh, therapy with placebo stimulation. Half of the participants did the, the treatment in that order, and the other half did the reverse order. They started with a placebo, and then went over to the anoral in the second phase. The outcome measure was naming. We looked at both trained items, so the items that were included on the computer task, and also generalization. So those were items that were not included in the treatments. In fact, the outcome uh, relied on the Philadelphia naming test. I know that many of you are familiar with the Philadelphia naming test. It's been used very widely in the literature, mainly uh, uh, it's, it's from Myrna Schwartz's group, and we used it a lot. The electrode placement, we put the anode electrode on the left frontal lobe because at that time we thought that the most convincing evidence about where brain changes were happening that spurred anomia recovery were happening in the left frontal lobe, and that was based on fMRI research. We put the catheter electrode on the right shoulder. Uh, we've actually gone away from that paradigm then later in, in later studies, and I'll, I'll mention that later. Um, and we used fMRI to target the location of the anode electrode. So everybody underwent fMRI uh, during a picture naming task. We looked at the greatest amount of activation in the left frontal lobe, and that's where we put the electrode. Now, whether that's needed or not, I have no idea. Especially considering that the electrode pad itself is very big. It's five by five centimeters. Um, the anodal TBCS consisted of stimulation with one milliamp, and that was uh, that occurred for the whole 20 minutes of the treatment. And the sham TBCS consisted of inducing the same current for 30 seconds and then slowly ramping it down over the next 15 seconds. The reason why we do that is because when you turn on turn on TBCS, you get really like a tingling or an itching effect under the, the active electrode. And that usually goes away uh, as the stimulation goes on. So that's the way we came up with the placebo or, or the sham condition. I'm just going to go straight into the results. Remember, this is a crossover design. Everybody gets both kinds of treatment. We're simply comparing now baseline performance to performance immediately after the treatment is done, so the first week. So let's say they finished on a Friday. We would test them on Saturday. And then we would do one week post assessment as well. We would just simply wait. They finished on a Friday. We would wait until the following Friday, and we would assess them again. So time one is the day after treatment is over. Time two is one week post. So here are the results. Uh, there was a statistically significant difference between the items that were trained with anodal TDCS compared to the items that were trained with sham. What you see on the y-axis here is simply the overall improvement in the number of items named. So this is following the anodal condition, this is following the sham condition, this is one day after, and this is one week after. And that was statistically significant. Um, also for untrained items, we did see an improvement, however it was not statistically significant. I know it looks like it, but there was a lot more variability among the participants here, and in addition, the Philadelphia naming test includes 175 items. We were only looking at 80 items when we were looking at trained items. So this is not a direct comparison between the two. But overall, there seems to be an improvement, uh, greater improvement following anodal TDCS compared to SHIM. So a brief discussion of this initial study. Um, so anodal TDCS uh, stimulation of the left frontal lobe improves naming in some participants. Uh, treatment response varied widely. For five participants, anoral actually resulted in better outcome than sham. For four people, it was very similar between the two, and one person actually responded to neither condition. So we thought, okay, um, this looks promising, actually way better than anything Chris and I and, and Julie had hoped for. 
But we thought that we would then do a second study, which I think is a much better uh, controlled study, in that it improved on the initial study in several different respects. Um, we only selected here participants with fluent aphasia. Out of those eight participants uh, that completed the, the trial, seven had anomic aphasia and one had conduction aphasia. They all had posterior damage, which was very different than the previous group. We selected people with uh, brain damage in many different regions and different sizes. These participants all had damage to either temporal and or parietal regions. Um, details on the aphasia treatment and the TDCS, we used the same picture word matching task that we used for aphasia treatment before. Instead of looking at change in correct names, so the number of correctly named items, we looked here at changes in the reaction time as a different marker of treatment response. The reason why we wanted to look at reaction time is because we thought it was more sensitive and also because some of these eight participants were actually scoring pretty high on the naming tasks that we had selected for uh, comparing pre-post uh, outcome. Like before, they got five sessions of anal TDCS and five sessions of sham. This was a crossover design just like before. However, the time between the two treatment phases, instead of being one week before, it was three weeks here. So a little bit longer time for post-treatment uh, assessment. <clears throat> treatment type was blinded, and that's something that I forgot to mention about the previous studies. Um, the participants uh, did not know what condition they were getting at any time, so whether they were getting sham or anal stimulation. And also, the clinicians that scored the outcome, these were student clinicians in our master's SLP program, they did not know uh, whether the outcome measure they were scoring was taken before or after, or whether it was before or after the annual or the TDC or the sham condition. So we videotaped everything, we saved the videotapes, and then the clinicians did blinded scoring essentially of, with regards to uh, condition. We also did something here that was different than in the first study. The clinicians that administered the treatment did not know the stimulus condition. They simply pressed a button on a computer, and then that computer was hooked up to the, the constant current uh, stimulator, and the computer had it pre-programmed into it whether that participant was getting anal or sham stimulation in the first or the second treatment phase. So you could basically call this triple one. Here are the results for the change in react reaction time during naming. Uh, the way that we look at this is that greater reduction reaction time is a marker of better treatment outcome. What we found was that immediately post-treatment, so in the day after treatment was over, we saw a greater reduction in reaction time uh, for the anal condition, which is the lighter gray color here, than the sham condition. We also looked at outcome at three weeks post, and we saw a greater reduction again that was maintained for the animal condition but much more variability in the sham condition at three weeks post. So, based on those two initial studies, it seems that TCS does indeed uh, affect behavioral aphasia treatment. There's some evidence for that. Now, like I said in the beginning, Many different labs are working on this issue, and I would encourage anybody who is interested in uh, PDCS as something that may enhance aphasia treatment outcome, is to look at, there are many different papers and many different labs that work on this, and I've listed them right there. And, and I don't want to slide anybody, there, there are more labs in addition to these folks, but those are just the ones that came in mind when I put together those slides. <laughs> anyway. Um, the limitation so far is that uh, the sample sizes tend to be small. Um, not all of those studies used randomized study assignment, and not all of them used blinded outcome testing. But I think the greatest limitation is that these tend to be fairly small sample size studies. And therefore, sample size certainly being one of the indicators of the strength by which we can interpret the, the research findings. <coughs> So that brings us into how we got into this uh, business of doing this randomized controlled trial. Um, so those two treatment studies that we did initially, we thought there is some evidence here to move on to a larger trial, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk about next. Just 
excuse me for a second. So the study question for the trial, just like before, was for individuals with chronic post-stroke aphasia who are undergoing aphasia therapy, does anaerobic TDCS enhance outcome? So anaerobic TDCS applied to the left hemisphere. We relied on what is called a futility design. I found that for many people this seems a little bit confusing. This is a design that is used widely in the clinical trials, trials world, but not so much for us who look at aphasia treatment outcome. We assumed, based on the previous studies, that anaerobic TBCS did indeed have an effect over Shan TBCS. That was our null hypothesis. What we were trying to prove in the alternative hypothesis was that they were similar. The implications being that if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, there's a reason to do more study, to implicate more study of the same effect that we think we're showing. However, if we reject that, no further study is necessary, that is, the, the trial is futile. I will say that for the, few, even though we, the futility hypotheses were the guiding hypotheses for this initial trial, we also did superior analyses, and I will talk about those results as well. This was a randomized controlled trial. We now increased the amount of treatment that participants were getting. We looked in the literature, the amount of uh, treatment that people with aphasia seemed to get, the average amount was about three weeks. Um, everybody was randomized now to either get anal TDCS or sham TDCS. So this was not a crossover like before. Everybody got the aphasia treatment, but you were randomized to get either the, the experimental condition, which was anal TDCS, or the controlled condition, which was <coughs> This was double-blinded as before both to participants and the speech-language pathologists that uh, did almost all of the data collection for this trial. The study design was as so, if we start on the left here and progress to the right, uh, we started with our uh, participant pool. Uh, they were randomized into either the active or the sham condition. Um, they received treatment for three weeks. And then once that treatment phase was over, we did post-testing at one week, four weeks, and six months. We did test for both uh, trend items and generalization. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. We started out with 89 potential participants. Uh, 15 were excluded based on different criteria. I'll show you the exclusion, ex inclusion exclusion criteria in just a bit. 74 were randomized into the study. That was our uh, target sample size when the, the trial started out. Uh, 34 were uh, uh, randomized to the anal condition, 40 to the sham. Uh, out of those, uh, on the, we go to the anal. Those in the anal condition all received 15 treatment sessions with anal stimulation. Uh, and then the other people here in the sham condition received the same aphasia treatment, only difference being that they got the sham condition. With regards to follow-up, we had three that were lost. One subject was lost after the 11th treatment session. He actually just quit the treatment. And two subjects were lost after the four-week post-treatment uh, follow-up. For the sham condition, um, nobody was lost to follow-up. One person withdrew after some uh, post-treatment sessions, uh, assessment session, and one person was continued due to an adverse event. And I will talk about adverse events later uh, when we talk about the results. So the, the primary analysis, was, which was change in naming, um, comparing baseline to one week post-treatment, included 34 people in the experimental group, or the anaerobic TBCS group, and 40 people in the control group. Uh, a little bit about the data management for this trial. We rely on the data coordination unit, unit at the Medical University of South Carolina. This has been absolutely crucial for the success of this trial. The data coordination unit uh, at NUSC is the primary data center for StrokeNet. StrokeNet is the largest clinical trials network in the country. It's uh, supported by the NINDS. And all they do pretty much is do uh, clinical trial uh, management and support. The nice thing is that when we are collecting our data, the speech pathologists 
when they collect your data, they enter all the data online into a database. And that's an encrypted database. And then um, everything that is collected both here and at, at the Medical University of South Carolina, which was our secondary site, that then populates this one single database. The other nice feature here is that they manage all the randomization and they ensure that everybody is blinded to treatment conditions, both the clinicians and the participants, as well as myself and any of the co-investigators that were included on the trial. All the data analyses that I'm about to report now were conducted by statisticians at the DCU in Charleston, at MUSC. So I think that that's a nice separation between us that are, that are, that are implementing the trial and the people then that do the data management and the actual analysis. Of course, there are people at the DCU that were not blinded uh, to the treatment condition. Uh, for the participants, we have several inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, the inclusion criteria was that you had to have had a single event ischemic stroke in the left hemisphere. You had to be greater than six months post-stroke between the ages of 25 and 80, previously right-handed, had to have aphasia confirmed with a western aphasia battery, no MRI contraindications because of the baseline MRI scans, able to achieve at least 65% accuracy on the screening version of the aphasia treatment test. So that treatment test that I talked about earlier, we wanted to make sure that when people came in, they could actually do the treatment tasks. So you had to be able to achieve 65% accuracy before you could be enrolled in the trial. Exclusion criteria, um, history of brain surgery, seizures during the previous 12 months, greater than 80% naming, uh, naming accuracy on the PMT. The reason why we, want, we included this as an exclusion criteria was because we didn't want participants to be close to ceiling. If you were scoring above 80%, you were excluded. We want to make sure that we would have some room for improvement. We also excluded participants if they were unable to overtly name five out of the 80 items that were included on the pre-treatment fMRI task. Because when we did the fMRI, we wanted to ensure that the activation that we're seeing with the fMRI, that it reflects actual naming. Um, the TDCS part, the stimulating device that we used uh, was produced uh, by IOMED. It's called the Fluorescer. It induced a 1 milliamp uh, current of, of anodal TDCS. The anode electrode was placed on the left scalp over a targeted cortical region. And just like in the last, the second one of the pilot studies, we targeted posterior regions. So residual areas that were now active during the, the naming task those areas were selected for the brain stimulation, uh, for, for the placement of the cathode electrode, I mean, anode electrode. The main reason, though, why we do the MRI is to make sure that we're not putting the active electrodes directly over the lesion. We don't want to basically try to induce the current straight into the lesion itself, which now, in most cases of chronic stroke, is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The cathode electrode was placed on the contralateral supraorbital frontal scalp region, so basically on the right frontal scalp, above the right eyebrow. There's just a couple of MRI scans that show you the targeted region, so that's the region that had the greatest activity. Some of these actually ended up being on the, the occipital temporal uh, junction, maybe some of them into the occipital lobe, but you will see in a little bit that these were fairly uniform with regards to the location where they will be selected for stimulation. All the participants had two MRI sessions at baseline, and anodal TDCS was started at the beginning of the behavioral treatment session and remained active for the first 20 minutes of a 45-minute treatment session. So now the treatment was more than double with regards to the session length. 45 minutes, we think, is a fairly typical uh, session for somebody who receives aphasia therapy either in subacute or chronic care. And that's why we changed that, uh, the length of that session. The sham TDCS, just like before, it was induced, the anodal TDCS was induced for 30 seconds and then it was gradually turned off within uh, 45 seconds. Here's a really nice image that, my, that Chris Warden made showing the coordinates for the electrode placement. 
the blue circles, if I remember correctly, uh, are the locations for the coordinates that had the highest activation for the ammo group. And the red, I think, if I remember cor correctly, is for the sham. But the point is that the location of the stimulation with regards to the highest uh, activation it was fairly similar across the, the two groups. It kind of just looks like it's random. The outcome factors here, the primary endpoint was change in correct naming at one week post-treatment. We looked at both trained items. Those were 80 randomly selected items from the 160 items that were included on the treatment task. We also looked at untrained items, and that was on the Philadelphia naming test, which includes 175 items. Um, pre to post treatment change was computed as the difference between the average of two treatment assessments and the average of two, two post treatment sessions. So just looking at the absolute change, I mean, at the actual change before and after treatment. We also look at uh, secondary endpoints, treatment outcome at four weeks and six months uh, post treatment. Naming accuracy was scored based on the Philadelphia naming score, naming test uh, scoring guidelines. We were only in this trial looking at changes in correct naming, not changes in errors. And here's another feature which I think was uh, really nice. Uh, the clinicians, the speech language pathologists, and participants guessed the treatment condition, so anoral versus sham, at the end of each week of the treatment. We simply asked them, tell us, do you think that you, or the person that you're treating, do you think that the condition here is anoral or sham? And then we were able to look at that afterwards to look at where we indeed aligning uh, the clinicians and the participants. Here are the results. I'm going to start with showing you the primary outcome, which was the outcome of one week. On the y-axis there is the actual change score calculated as pre compared to post uh, assessment. And what we have here in the blue line is the outcome for the anaerobic group. And in the black line, is the outcome for the sham group. So there was a 13.9 word increase for the anaerobic group, but 8.2 uh, word increase for the sham group at, at one week. This constituted a 70% increase in correct naming for the anaerobic over sham. The futility hypothesis, uh, the p-value was 0.896, suggesting that we would not reject the null hypothesis that uh, that annual TDCS was indeed better than, than sham. The superiority analysis, which is simply nothing but a t-test, um, was statistically significant, one killed, adjusted for severity. We did adjust baseline for aphasia severity because we know that aphasia treatment outcome actually correlates with overall severity. So that people that are more severe tend to benefit less from treatment than people who are less severe. So we controlled for aphasia severity at baseline in those analyses. At four weeks, the people in the, the analog uh, group improved by 16.8 words. Those in the sham group improved by 9.4, a 79% increase in analog compared to sham. The futility hypothesis, again, was not statistically significant. And the superiority analysis, again, the t-test uh, showing that difference, was statistically significant at 0.027. Finally, at 24 weeks, the difference was 14.9 words compared to 7.1 in favor of the animal group over sham, a difference of 109%. Again, the futility hypothesis was not statistically significant, but the, the superiority analysis was, suggesting that it was a statistically significant better outcome for the animal group compared to the sham. Some other relevant data. Remember we asked the clinicians and the, the participants to guess whether they were getting anode or sham. Uh, for both of those groups, their guessing accuracy was essentially a chance. So participants guessed with 47, almost 48% accuracy what condition they were getting, and the clinicians were a little better, suggesting that blinding was maintained throughout the study. Improvement on the treatment task, uh, all but one participant improved on the treatment task as calculated as greater task accuracy on the last treatment session compared to the first treatment session. The mean change in accuracy on the treatment task uh, was 10 
almost 10, well, a little bit more than 10%. Um, I wanted to show you generalization from trained to untrained items. So if, what I plotted here is trained items, which is what we call naming 80, those 80 items that were randomly drawn from the trained items. Here's the improvement. So the higher you go, the more you improve. Uh, and also what you see here on the x-axis is improvement on the PMT, the Philadelphia naming test. The folks that are represented by the blue circles are the folks, the folks that received animal, and the folks in the green are the ones that got the sham. Uh, there was a fairly good correlation approaching 0.4 with regards to R squared there, suggesting that folks who uh, improve more with naming 80 are the same folks that improve more on the PMT. I also have similar data for four weeks and for 24 weeks. Uh, again, here the R squared is 0.32, still fairly strong correlation between the two conditions, so improvement on naming 80 and improvement on the PMT. And then finally, uh, at 24 weeks, the R squared there is almost 0.5. Um, again, blue is uh, anodal, green is sham. So, suggesting that we actually got fairly good uh, uh, generalization from trained to untrained items. Uh, with regards to adverse events, a major part of this trial was to look at, is this producing adverse events in the participants? Because if you get a high rate of adverse events, this may not be worth it, even if you're seeing a nice uh, treatment outcome. Uh, but we were very glad to see that there were very few adverse events included here. If you look at the, the left column here, these are the folks that got anormal stimulation. The right column are the folks that got sham. Uh, the number of different adverse events that we collected was two for headache, for the sham group, none for the anodal group. Dizziness, two versus one for sham versus anodal. Uh, a couple of people in the anodal group got erythema, which is nothing but redness of the skin. Uh, convulsion, which is a seizure. One person in the sham group actually had a seizure. Not during the actual treatment session, but rather, I think, on the night of the sixth treatment session. He had a, had a seizure, had to go to the ER, and subsequently was uh, uh, excluded from further treatment. However, we did do post-treatment assessment on that person, but no more uh, treatment. This was an intent-to-treat trial, which means that all the data that you collect are included in the final analysis, and fruit, which is fairly typical for clinical trials. One person had hypertension in the sham group, but none in the anal. Um, None of these uh, differences were significant, but overall the message here is that very few adverse events uh, locally with this, uh, with anodal TBCS. The final thing that I would like to discuss is um, the effect of BDNF genotype on the treatment outcomes. Um, at the time that we were, well slightly before we put in the grant application to support this trial, there was this very important study uh, published by Fritsch et al. on looking at BDNF uh, genotype and its effect on response to direct current stimulation. And based on this study, we actually wanted to look at the same issue in our trial. Fritsch et al. used a mouse model um, and used anal uh, direct current stimulation, or DCS, for 15 minutes, which was paired with stimulation synaptic stimulation of synaptic activation, which then led to increase in postsynaptic potential in M1 slices. We thought that this was pretty intriguing. This increase lasted at least two hours beyond the termination of the direct current stimulation. So um, this suggested that activity dependent secretion of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, is necessary for long-term synaptic plasticity induced by direct current stimulation. BDNF is encoded by the BDNF gene, and a common single SNP, the RS6265, also called VAL66MAT or VALMAT, is associated with 18 to 30% reduction in secretion of BDNF in humans. BDNF is thought to be very important for many different aspects of brain plasticity, which is why it's become very, uh, uh, it's been looked at in many different studies since then. And, and before them as well. 
In normal subjects, the men allele is associated with poor memory performance, decreased plasticity of the motor cortex, and in stroke patients, the meta allele is associated with poor motor rehabilitation outcome in patients with moderate to mild impairment, poor learning of a normal motor task, and lower ipsilateral cortical brain activation. I, I must say that when we're talking about the meta allele here, we're talking about carriers of either um, uh, uh, Valmat or MedMet, as opposed to what we call the typical genotype, which is which is Val, Val which is included in about 65% of the population. But that does vary somewhat based on ethnic and racial background. So we thought if annual PDCS modulates synaptic plasticity during a facial treatment, here, then perhaps individuals with typical BDNF genotype benefit more from adjuvant annual TDCS during a facial treatment compared to those with atypical BDNF genotype. So typical here simply being valva and those with atypical being Valmet or Metmet. It's an excellent slide that I made in about five minutes this morning showing our <laughs> expected outcome. Um, what we thought was that in the blue line here was that for those with typical BDNF genotype, we would see the greatest response to anodal TBCS. We would see a main effect, however, of uh, BDNF compared, uh, yeah, of typical BDNF compared to atypical BDNF, but there would be an interaction. Since based on the Fritz et al. study, those with the, that get the anodal TBCS should benefit the most, and certainly greater than those with the who got sham TDCS, as well as those with atypical BDNF genotype, regardless of stimulation type. So we expected two things, an interaction between TDCS and BDNF genotype, and we also expected a main, main effect of BDNF. So, um, the BDNF genotyping was, we collected two milliliter of whole blood sample in all of our participants. This was all sent to DNA Genotype, which is a company that uh, did all the genotyping for us. The genotyping was completed on RS6265, and we looked at, again, what I explained before, typical, we, this is very consistent with the literature, what people consider typical genotype, val val or atypical val map or met met with regards to RS6265. <laughs> Here's the breakdown of the sample. Um, you notice that we had 74 people in the trial, but we only had uh, genotype information for 66. We lost some samples due to a malfunction in a freezer, and one participant actually refused to have it, his blood drawn, so nothing we could do about that. Um, if we look here at the distribution across the anodal uh, condition, so the TDCS condition, a 16 got anodal TDCS and had typical BDNF genotype. 13 had got anodal TDCS but had the atypical BDNF genotype. 20 had sham, got sham TDCS but had a, uh, typical BDNF. And then finally, this last group of these 17 people here got sham and also had the atypical B BDNF genotype. So fairly even distribution of, uh, across the four groups. Okay, here are the results. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, what I would point out first is that these two bar graphs on the left are for the folks that got anodal TDCS. Those two bar graphs on the right are for the folks that got sham. On the top, we've included participants with typical BDNF genotype, and at the bottom, those who have atypical BDNF genotype. The y-axis represents proportional improvement in outcome. The reason why we looked at proportional rather than just counted the change in the number of items was because we want to be able to compare the naming 80, which is what you see in the darker gray columns, to the PNT. So remember, we are naming 80 with only 80 items. The PNT has 175. The, the way that we looked at the proportion was actual improvement divided by potential improvement. Does that make sense? And then we just compared that across both the naming 80 and the PNT. Uh, we looked at this at one week, four weeks, and 24 weeks for each one of the four groups. And then I just averaged in those last two columns uh, the overall improvement across the, four, the three uh, post-treatment data points. 
think that explains pretty much all of it. What we found was that with regards to the people with atypical BDNF, the treatment was very similar. The treatment outcome was very similar. However, for the folks with uh, typical BDNF, those who, who got the anormal TDCS condition uh, did way better than those who had sham. Also, those with, uh, who got anormal TDCS and had typical BDNF did also statistically significantly better than those with atypical BDNF regardless of stimulation type. Okay? So we've got the interaction of that. And I'm going to show that here on the next slide. Uh, for the Navy 80, the interaction was statistically significant between BDNF genotype with TDCS, but there was no main effect of BDNF genotype. And this was also the case for the PNT. The interaction was there, but no effect of BDNF genotype. So that um, one out of the two expected outcomes uh, came to fruition. The, the main effect that we thought we would see did not. Now, there was something interesting that we found that I, I'm going to share with you that we did not expect. If we compare the two groups at baseline with typical and atypical <coughs> BDNF genotype, what we found was that for, all the, for several of the measures that we had, there was an actual baseline difference based on BDNF genotype. The folks that had normal BDNF or typical BDNF had higher aphasia quotient by almost 12 points on the Western aphasia battery. That was statistically significant. They also did better on the naming ADA baseline. They also did better on the Philadelphia naming test at baseline. However, we did not see statistically significant differences on other factors that we assessed, like the pyramids and palm trees test, the matrix score from the, the matrix subtest from the weights, uh, the amount of exercise that people uh, accomplished. The reason why we looked at exercise is because Exercise has been linked to uh, BDNF, uh, ex uh, uh, amount of BDNF in, in serum, and we thought that maybe that was going to be some kind of a mediating factor, but there was no difference between the groups there. There was not a statistically significant difference in the NI stroke scale, suggesting that perhaps the samples were similar with regards to stroke severity. But I would keep in mind that these participants that are selected here are selected primarily because of one thing. They have aphasia. So we see baseline differences in, um, um, based on BDNF genotype in language, um, but not other factors like age, years of education, tempo, stroke, and lesion size. Um, why this is the case, I think we can talk about it at the end, but that certainly was not something that we were expecting. Um, I think what could be happening here is that if BDNF genotype has an effect, um, it takes a long time to materialize. And the reason why I say that is because a recent study by a Dutch group, led by my friend Mieke van de Sant, um, did not find early treatment uh, differences between people with no, uh, typical and atypical BDNF genotype. What seems to be happening, if, if we assume that these groups started out similarly, that the group that has the, the typical BDNF genotype recovers more than those with atypical. Of course, the study was never set up to look at this issue, but I think that's something that we need to look at in the future. So the discussion, uh, based on our results, uh, anormal TDCS seems to enhance the effect of aphasia therapy, at least for anomia. We can't claim that this has effects of other parts of, of language processing. Uh, the BDNF genotype does predict the response to the anormal TDCS, and as importantly, there were no adverse effects associated with anormal TDCS. But certainly, further research is needed to verify these effects. I will say that for all the participants that did receive anormal TDCS, I think we're talking maybe six, I can't remember exactly, 600 plus hours, I mean, 600 plus sessions of anormal TDCS. Based on that, it seems highly unlikely that this has any major adverse events associated with it. So, indirect continuation of that, is TDCS ready for clinical use? Probably not. I think that we need to do more research to verify the effects that we're finding here. Uh, most of the effects that, the effect sizes that we are finding are small to medium. So, I would emphasize that 
when we say small to medium, it's not the effect size of the aphasia treatment itself, but rather it's the added benefit of the anaerobic TVCS over sham. So if you already have an aphasia treatment that might have a small to medium effect size, adding TVCS to that might be a very good option, at least for some people. If this does make its way into clinical use, I suspect that uh, we're going to have to do some extensive clinical clinician training. We need to figure out better where and how to stimulate the cortex. Um, I don't know whether we need the MRI for the electrode placement based on the coordinates that I showed you earlier. I suspect that it's probably not as important as we thought before. And of course, with regards to the BDNF genotype results, would you want to do that before you initiate treatment with this? So in closing, uh, TVCS modulates brain activity. The mechanisms are still not clear, but the BDNF in relation to postsynaptic activity may be uh, an indicator of what's happening. TVCS may improve a patient treatment outcome. We don't know for whom, other than this, uh, this thing with the BDNF. We don't know when is the best time to do this. We don't know what the best dosage is. We don't know whether one whether two milliamps would have given us greater or better treatment outcome. And we don't know what the best format is. Uh, should you stimulate bilaterally? Should you stimulate uh, one treatment phase, the, the left hemisphere, and another treatment phase, the right hemisphere? These are all questions that need to be answered in future studies. Uh, the baseline factors may help speech language pathologists predict whether a patient is likely to respond to treatment. That's something that we need to look into further with the data set that we already have, but that's certainly in the works. A couple of notes, if you want to look at our trial, how it was registered on clinicaltrials.gov, here's the identifier. This was very generously, uh, the research was very generously supported by a grant from the NIDCD, and this was all conducted here in the Aphasia Laboratory and Aphasia Laboratory itself, which is at NUSC in Charleston. And, uh, and later we've added C-STAR. Our team consisted of Astrid Fredrickson, Chris Rorden, Brielle Stark, and Alex Basilakos here at the University of South Carolina, as well as many different graduate students that helped out a lot with many different aspects of the, the trial. Also at the Medical University of South Carolina, Lee Oponia, Jordan Elm, who was the primary statistician for this trial, and Katie Murphy. So I'll be that I'll end and take any questions you might have. No. Yes. So have we looked at lesion location as a predictor of treatment outcome? Um, we have not. We have looked at the lesion location for the two groups to just see if there was a statistically significant difference between the two groups, and there's not. So the two groups, at least, uh, based on just a VLSM straight up t-test on box of blood also basis, there was no difference. But that is definitely a good point, and you would want to probably do that for the both groups independently and also combine the two. But we have a really rich data set, and I would say that so far we've only focused on the primary analysis. I mean, um, I'm just wondering if you try, give, given the, the two main genotypes that you distinguished between uh, ended being different also in kind of where they started in severity, I wonder if your data has enough power to actually allow you to do some sort of regression analysis or somehow to separate the roles of severity at onset along any one of those dimensions and the genotype. Yeah. <clears throat> I can't say that we've done, I mean, we knew going in that severity was probably going to be a significant predictor of outcome. There was a big clinical trial last year published by a German group that showed that exactly. Um, so we did control for the overall aphasia severity, but we didn't look at any great detail of what specifically about their language impairment was particularly important. So I don't know if we had enough power, we'll definitely try it. Chris? So you said this isn't really ready for clinical prime time, but how about if this is one of your own loved ones? I mean, what, 
it seems like you found no negative effects. What are the, what's the hesitation? Yeah, so, I mean, I think you always want to be careful. Um, none of the effects are huge. I mean, when you do the superiority analyses, um, the smallest one, I think, was 0 0.2, 0 0.02, something like that. But I think that given that we are not finding any major adverse events associated with this, I don't think that this is going to do any harm. So I would probably suggest that they do it. I, I don't think you have anything to lose. Um, I don't see any harm. So if, if, if I was strictly talking about me and my family, I would say, yeah, I would, I would probably go for it. Yeah. And this is something that I'm thinking about cost and where you might be able to implement this. Is this only to be used in a medical setting? Could it be used um, in a mental setting? What do you visualize or envision for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have a, a trial going on right now with um, R.G. Hillis at Johns Hopkins, where they're doing this in patients in subacute care. But I know that a fairly recent study by Mika Van Desant, who I mentioned earlier, did not show an effect of amyloid TBCS in subacute care. The problem with that kind of research is that if you simply, I think that they're starting at the wrong end. I think that they're starting like at the end point with regards to clinical trial. I think it's very difficult to show this effect if you just took this out to the nursing home right now. You would have to have a huge group of participants because once you get into cl the clinical care, the amount of co-founding factors is just that much magnified. I think you start always, which is why we start with animal studies and then we build up. I think if you start on the other end, I think that you're probably not going to see the effects that you want. Um, if this is indeed uh, supported by a second trial, the effects that we find here, and that the, the effects are translating into meaningful changes in communication, I would say that uh, certainly in home health and outpatient therapy, um, I, I would be, I had to hedge my bets, that's where I would start. On the device, it's not that expensive? No, that's another nice thing. I mean, I, mean, I can't remember how expensive these devices are, Chris. Aren't they like 600 bucks? Something like I think these are 250, but that's yeah. massive medical over uh, markup, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, these devices are pretty simple. The number one thing is that they, they, low, they, they run at a very low voltage. So the chance that you're going to harm somebody is fairly low. Uh, the devices are cheap. I worry at the same time about if people are simply now going to take this into clinical care immediately. I think the, the opportunity for abuse and doing this wrong is probably pretty extensive, um, which is why I think that we would need, if you were to get this in clinical care, I would want to make sure that that clinician is, has been trained a lot to do this. Huh? Um. <clears throat> The levels or the the subjects that you used, um, the subjects the the aphasic subjects you used, were they tested or were they? Is it was there a uh, minimum level that they had to have to participate? Yes, to participate. Yes. So they had to be able to name those five oh, items. Oh, that's right. At the beginning, mm -hmm. so yeah. that didn't exclude people with yeah. very severe aphasia. Sure. So people who are almost averbal, those people tended not to get included. And I can't remember exactly what the distribution of aphasia types was. I think there were maybe, off the top of my head, I think there were maybe two people with global aphasia, which is the most severe form mm -hmm. of aphasia. Sure. But they did make it in. So that suggests that, you know, that's not necessarily an exclusion, a, a complete exclusion from something like this in this in this study. But um, yeah, so we probably excluded some people with global aphasia because they did not name more than five items of these. Thanks. I mean, Could you go back to the slide with the scatter plots that show the... Um, the general section? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. 
I was trying to kind of so, like make sense of this together with the other data that you show and kind of project all the um, and see the group differences. So project kind of the blue point, say, on the y-axis, and the, and somehow this in these plots the two group, the the groups are not very differentiable. Well, if you look at if you just look at like exactly if we put like a line straight through here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people that are above that line. For blue, there's one for green. Okay. Okay. If you put a line through, let's say at forty, there's not a single green. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But it, it now, seems like. Now, keep in mind that if you look at any clinical trial, yeah. like for that clinical trial that I mentioned from Germany last year. Um, I talked to one of the main authors on that paper. Out of all the people that were included, I think it was 100, maybe 160, something like that, about 40% of them showed no treatment response. Right. And this is very typical for this field. But then again, if you look at any clinical trial, you're looking at averages, which is why you know this is probably likely to work for a good part of the, the, the population. It's not going to work for everybody. What, what this suggests is that the distribution may be perhaps not not be best represented by kind of a mean or average because it looks like the effect is really driven by this group of really lucky subjects who kind of somehow this really worked well for them whereas there are many other blues who are kind of right with the greens. Yeah, but that's, that's the case always for them. Okay. Always. But that's just whenever you get any kind of a clinical treatment, there is no treatment that always works for everybody. That's very rare. Especially if you look at... Huh? You're trying to identify what helps you find... Yeah, yeah. And then that's the second. So what we were talking about earlier, what you really want to get at then is what, what are the responses. I mean, this is no more apparent than in cancer research. Yeah. We've been, we, give, uh, we give a lot of treatment for people with the same kind of cancer, but they respond very differently. You probably see... I wouldn't say you're going to see the same kind of a scatter plot that you see right here. But essentially what you want to get at is what, what is the tumor type? What are the genetics that predict outcome? So I don't see any reason to think that uh, we would be dealing with some of the same kinds of predictors here. I would just say it's, it's kind of similar to your speech training, where there's some people who respond really well to it, and others who don't, maybe kind of thing. One of the things that would be, you can look for in the future is a bespoke where we can identify which people will benefit from which treatment, and then they really get some of its applications. Yeah, that's a good point, Chris. So I would say in continuation of that, CSTAR, the polar project on CSTAR is specifically made for this point. That is to figure out what are the baseline factors that tell you how much you expect somebody to respond to that treatment. So we have two different kinds of treatment phases. We want to be able to tell the clinicians Here's a new person that came in for treatment. Based on your baseline data, how can you use those baseline data to tailor your treatment towards that patient's best, uh, best needs and uh, greatest chance for that having benefit from that treatment? That's, that's sort of like the second phase of this. We have uh, two questions from Kiran and Sarkini online. Shall I do them one by one? The first is, wonderful talk, Julius. Thanks. Have you tried to regress the initial BDNF for the TTCS effect? No, because... It's a binary measure. Yeah, it's a binary measure. Um, and the other thing is that it's not like uh, the animal group was mostly getting BDNF, had mostly normal BDNF. As you saw in that pie chart, it was pretty evenly distributed and in a chi-square analysis. There was there was no differences across the groups. And the second question is, in the generalization discussion, do you assume that the mechanism for generalization and treatment effect is the same yes. because they correlate? I do. I do. I mean, I think that when people talk about generalization and aphasia and talk about uh, that being some kind of a different effect, it's nice to talk about. We know almost nothing about it. I mean, I have no reason to think that they're not the same. And we know, I mean, I really, squirm or cringe when we start getting into these highly philosophical questions about treatment response when we know almost nothing about what we're doing. Good questions, Karan. Thank you. Oh. 
I'm curious, is there any good uh, method to measure the expression of BDNF in the brain? You know, right? Not that I know of. So, this is a very good question. So, I talked to Fei Fei about this. I've been sort of like an accidental student of genetics. We did, I have to say that this was sort of like a side project, the BDNF genotype part. We thought, I mean, my background is, is in clinical uh, physiology. Um, I think that that's something that we need to look at. We need to look at it very carefully. But right now, I cannot speak intelligently about that. How's the animal model, like a mouse? Yeah, all they looked at was the specific effect of knockout mice on the uh, the effect of uh, action potential. That's all they, that that I remember from that paper. Okay. Yeah. But there's a lot that has been written about this gene. I have to say I need to do a crash course over the summer, getting getting more into this literature. Yeah, it's very interesting. But interesting about this gene. Um, mm -hmm. I will go back and uh, check. How is this gene um, looks like in the cancers, in the uh, I mean, types of cancers? Right? When you're done, come and talk to me. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. I think this also just to add to that, it's not like if you are a met carrier that you necessarily have less BDNF. I think your BDNF is less um, responsive. Yes. It's not necessarily that you secrete less. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. In terms of location, of location that is targeted by TBCS, in the first study you had frontal areas. Yes. In the trial you switched to occipital temporal cortex. So how critical is the location? Is that, I mean, it, it would seem like it has pretty critical, but it seems like it, there is some improvement no matter what you do. Or, what is the yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, the studies that have been done so far, again, there, there's a fairly small sample size studies. Based on the literature with regards to functional activation changes, if we think that this somehow is affecting the same areas that are responsible already for naming, um, where those functional changes are happening, based on the largest study, I think that they are mostly in the left hemisphere, and mostly in posterior re regions. There's a fairly recent paper by Jerzy Zbarski's group uh, that suggests that the main functional activation changes that happen that drive anomia recovery are in the residual language cortex. It's not like other regions are taking over. And I, our studies have shown that one paper in 2012 in uh, Neuroimage and another paper in uh, Journal of Neuroscience in 2010. If I had to put my if I had to guess, I would think those posterior regions are the regions that I would recommend people target. But the problem has been that, it, it, of course, it takes a long time to do these studies. What needs to be done is that we need to compare different stimulation sites and see if the effect differs based on the stimulation location. And also the contralateral hemisphere, whether it's stimulation there, is there any work with that? Is that stimulating the contralateral hemisphere to take over? There has been some, but I don't think the results have been nearly as promising. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much.